Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You need that. So officially, good afternoon. Um, welcome to our session. This is a near and dear topic to both Nick and I. Um, it's really interesting when you, oh Christ. <laughs> when you think about it, predicting the future goes back to a long time ago. I mean, this is the uh, illustration of the uh, Tower of Delphi. And people would come and want to know the future and the oracle, which of course was a woman, um, would go into these feverish pitches and, and thrash around and almost mumble. And um, then we'll tell you more about that a little later on. So, that, so the point of this is, is it's nothing new. How many of you have seen Moneyball? Oh, you all have to see it if you haven't. First of all, Brad Pitt is in it, which isn't bad. But. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, what was so incredible about seeing that movie is I, I didn't know the story. I'm not a sports enthusiast. And well, what have you seen it? How would you describe it? You, you saw it, right? Did you? Yeah. You did. I uh, uses pure statistics to make up the composition of the baseball team. And they rocked it. Exactly, and he was a f this, uh, this man who was hired by the, I can't think of his name right now, he was hired by the Oakland A's and changed that, that team completely because of it. Now I doubt there's any sports that isn't using analytics because of it. The person that I followed for years now, probably two decades, is a guy by the name of Tab Tom Davenport. He's a professor at Babson College in Boston. And he understands and, and really thinks about information in a way I don't know anybody else that does. And if you have any chance to read any of his books, I would recommend it. There's a, one that's out. It's a revision of an earlier one called Competing on Analytics. Get it if you're interested because it's really, I, I think, good stuff. And what, what Davenport uh, did for the Harvard Business Review, first of all, I don't think before he called the data scientist the sexiest job of the 21st century, that the word sex was ever used in the Harvard Business Review. I mean, this was incredible. And indeed, if you are a data scientist, you can get hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So I urge you all for other reasons than just looking at your data, for examining this and also do what um, Nick has done, is find those data analysts within your own organization. I can remember a, a corporate real estate guy from Merck, this was probably 10 years ago, he, he had the most extraordinary practice for Merck, and the reason was he'd go to the scientists and he'd have him help work with it. He had an early version of IWMS, and he'd, he'd use this data scientist then to look at all the data. So indeed, data science is not simple. It's in this very sort of complex illustration. It's a combination of computer science, statistics, as, um, as Monty was mentioning, and then the whole knowledge and computational domain. One thing that I also do suggest, and this is something that I think is really important, is the language of data science and the language of um, data analytics. It's really important for you to understand what algorithms are. Once you do, you'll realize we're completely controlled by them, anything from the time you're using Facebook or Google or whatever. But, uh, but I think that's something in terms of a skill set that's really important. Because once you understand the power of algorithms, you can start thinking about things, I think, entirely differently. Next. So I've been really um, working with data, big data and analytics since, tw since 2013. And next. And it was in the next year, in 2014, that Jay, this is a slide from 2014. And what they did was say, they did a study on, um, in this case, how corporate real estate was using analytics. At the time, only 28% of the people surveyed were, but they predicted by last year it would be 56%. And indeed, it's, it's that. That's my phone of all things. Uh, <laughs> bad timing. Um, next. 
And and Nick, this is this is good for you to talk because he mentioned the business case for analytics. So do you want to mention if, uh, how cost reduction and these things play into why we did it? Um, well, when we first started to look at that, this, it was purely on a performance reporting that we wanted to look at. We weren't getting a, a great visual representation of data. We wanted to make sure that we could get a better understanding of data that, that, that we're looking at, what information is coming out of, uh, of plan on. Um, and be able to then start to focus on how we can reduce costs by uh, utilizing the workforce better, as an example. So there's lots of examples of work that we can look at with cost redu reduction, uh, which I won't go into all now, um, but we're, we're, we've got loads of uh, different ways that we can do that. Okay, next one. And um, for a lot of the research that we do, we depend on Gartner, which is probably the biggest uh, IT analyst um, that we have in the US. Uh, now another uh, analyst has emerged in the UK called Verdantix, and they are also um, mapping what is going on in our space. But this is very typical of the, of the stages you go through with data analytics, and first, a lot of what Nick was mentioning, he started out in really what is known as descriptive analytics. You're looking at what's happened. Um, and then it started moving up to, f fang. I love the, 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 <laughs> the initials FANG. You can imagine what that stands for. It's Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. And they started moving towards much more, um, more diagnostics analytics, probably around 2014, 2015, and then that started to catch on in the private sector. Um, and, and so really trying to understand why these patterns are emerging, what is the data telling you, to the fact that now we're looking at what will happen, predictive analytics, we're able to do that, and then what we'll be moving on to next is prescriptive analytics. Not only what will happen, why did it happen, but, or what will happen next, but what should happen next? What, what should we do to this motor to keep it working? Um, and so it's there, we're going from information to optimization, what Fred was talking about in the presentation before. Next. And then Nick's gonna go into his live data, but, um, and he talked a little bit about this in his presentation this morning, next. But something that I just learned about in, um, I, I spent recently two weeks in the Netherlands, and, and something came up called thick data. And I'd never, has anybody heard of this before? Um, and it, it's really interesting concept, and something that you're gonna say, of course, but I mean, it's, it's something to really look at. And this is a young woman who worked for Nokia for a while, and what she did is she really wanted to understand how people use mobility in China. And she did everything from taking wontons on her scooter to construction sites. She sat in these um, game uh, places where, where people are sitting at these consoles for hours at a time. Next. And she had about 100 examples of why Nokia should change course and not just com competing on these expensive smartphones. She said what's really needed are cheaper phones. And, and Nokia basically said, what, you have 100 examples. Why, why do we care? And they, this is really qual qualitative data that in many cases people just throw away. They don't think about where as Nokia says, we have a million pieces of data that tell us that we should continue on the line for expensive phones. We all know what happened to Nokia's phones. They're gone. Next. So it, again, I think um, through the years, it's really interesting. The concept of storytelling has never been more, more important. And indeed, even GIS has now story, story maps that you can tell different kinds of things through the visualization and the use of GIS. So these stories become very important and, and, um, and something that we should start listening to. Next. So 
it says to form a complete picture, both big and thick data are critical because they produce different types of insight at varying scales and depths. So we really need both to understand what the data is telling us. And what's interesting about going back to the oracle is that in reality, and there's a big controversy on exactly what kind of fumes were coming from the ground in the temple of Delphi, but it was indeed these natural things that were causing the oracle to go into all of these um, strange noises and predict in her predictions, but it was really the men around her, indeed they were men, that were interviewing the people that would come there for their predictions, finding out in more information, and then trying to interpret the oracle's uh, uh, predictions through that. So they too had this qualitative data, which I think is very interesting. Next. So what we're actually moving now is business intelligence is being less discussed. It's really business analytics, and I think that's a much better term. And even with things like space now, we're starting to do and have the kind of data through sensors, et cetera, that we really understand how space is being used. And one of the sacred um, realms of higher education has been faculty offices. So this is a recent um, addition that was added to the Chronicle of Higher Education. On, and one of the stories they tell there is about how now we're looking at faculty space not being utilized the way it should, that they're, as we've had agile workplaces, they're going to also have to start thinking about agile use of different kinds of spaces where they can collaborate with their peers, et cetera. So the data is starting to say things that are hard to refute. So uh, we saw this slide this morning in, uh, in my keynote, data into knowledge, into action, into customer value. Um, when we first started to, to look at Tableau, um, what we were after was getting away from the Excel reports and all these sort of things, getting away from having to write reports for our management boards every month. Um, what's the, we're spending that much time putting papers together and people sitting around a big table with all this paper. I just We've got all these screens in all our meeting rooms. Uh, we're able to show live data and put it on the screens in the meeting rooms and talk about it interactively. Um, with live data. So what, what we've done with Planon and Tableau is we've got an always live connection. So the data I'll show you today is always live as we're looking at it. Um, there won't be much going on with it now because they're all in bed. Um, but the, the basically um, it, it enables people to sit around a room and really interact with the data and give us some more uh, uh, ideas and how, how we're, we can look at poor performance. We'll have a look at it. So just bear in mind, I'm going back to uh, to Lancaster now. So um, connection might be a wee bit uh, slow at times. Nancy was just talking about um, spaces. And we do um, space utilization. This looks tremendous, doesn't it? We've got loads of space utilization. We've got uh, Hefke gives us grades of utilization. Uh, so HEFKE is a Higher Ed Education Funding Council for England. And they basically say that uh, if your utilization is 0 to 15%, it's really poor. 15 to 25 poor, et cetera. 45% to 100% is very good utilization, according to our funding council. So you can see all the green bits there. It looks really good on our, our data. We look like we're doing a tremendous job. Can I ask a question of the room? How do you do space utilization at the moment? Because the way that's done, believe it or not, is a one-week survey of the year. That's all that is. So it's not great, actually, is it? It's not brilliant data. Uh, the last year, we actually did it for two weeks. So how does that work? I spoke to somebody last night who said they do a four-month survey, but it's still somebody going around and surveying and looking at utilization. I see a couple of people nodding. Is that what happens in the States? Is it manual survey?
Yeah. Okay. So I mentioned this morning that um, our students now within the Isle Lancaster app, they can walk into their seminar and they scan their attendance. That's going to give us so much more uh, information. They promised me they'd have some information for me this week. They failed miserably. <laughs> I'm never, ever going to forgive them for it. So that's space utilization. As we continue our little... Uh, Story here, by the way, these are random uh, tableau charts put together just to give you guys a flavor. This, this is, uh, we, we sort of touched on this a little bit this morning looking at uh, condition, but this is reactive maintenance now um, across our campus. So you can see all the, the red dots on the, the map of campus. Uh, this is my GIS. Um, all the little red dots that are across campus, and you can see the um, tree map over on the right-hand side. So basically all those red dots represent those work orders on the right-hand side. And what, I, what we're wanting to do is interact with our data. So I've got a big red dot there, so we'll, we'll click on that and see what's going on in that building. Of course, you could do this the other way around. If we look at the whole campus, uh, we're looking at, we've got a lot of faulty lights on campus at the moment. So if I click on faulty lights over on the other side now, it's telling me where the faulty lights are. So again, we've got some bigger red dots um, around the place. So down here, this building has got a lot of, uh, a lot of faulty lights. Go around there, Nick, you can see it then. How many faulty lights has that got? 13 faulty lights in that building at the moment. Maybe, I'm not an electrician, don't know but it just shows you the power of interacting with that data. Let's have a look at something else. So this is um, planned maintenance that we've got going on on our campus. Um, this is in Boland Tower. So on our campus, we have a tower which is um, 14 stories. It's tiny, right, compared to you guys, I guess. Um, but that's massive, massive for us. Uh, did people hear about the Grenfell fire in London? Um, really shocking events, nearly 100 people killed because the um, cladding on the outside was highly flammable and the building just went boom. And the fire brigade was saying, stay in your rooms, you're gonna be all right. Uh, horrible, horrible story. Um, but what that did in the UK, UK is uh, then everybody started to look at that and think, um, we've got a tower. What's the cladding like on our tower? What are we doing uh, with our tower? How is our planned maintenance in our tower? And what we're able to do with Tableau is pull up all the planned maintenance. And you can see over here, we've got sprinkler systems. We have four sprinkler system checks. And you can also see here a massive white space because we weren't doing them. So Tableau quickly and efficiently showed us that we weren't doing a sprinkler system check. Turns out we were doing them, by the way, but we weren't recording it in plan on, which is just as bad because somebody comes along and you, you can't prove it. Um, so you see all the dots that then come along underneath. So we're doing the weekly checks here, uh, whatever these are, monthly checks, three monthly checks. Um, so we're, we're getting all the, the checks in place power of Tableau to be able to, to give us all that uh, information quickly and easily. As I said, we started out with performance reports. So simple things like that, which is um, looking at our maintenance team, how many jobs have we completed within the timescales? Uh, so maintenance, cleaning, landscape. Um, somebody needs to be having a word with our landscape manager right now, don't they? Because he's 50-50 uh, he's there. Um, what we're able to do with this is just interact with it a little bit more so we can add a few months of data on perhaps and we can start to see the trends of how the teams are performing over a given time. So you can see the landscape team is generally pretty good but for this month uh, he's having a, a bit of a blip, been in the bars. We can also look over, um, compare ourselves over uh, against last year. 
So now we're looking at 2017 against 2018. We've improved with maintenance. We've gone worse with cleaning. Let's not mention landscape anymore. But down uh, here as well, we're giving some more figures to it and showing um, urgent, high, medium, low, so our priorities of workload. So we can start to look at uh, are we responding to all the urgent jobs on time. Um, we get four hours to fix an urgent task, which is quite a short amount of time, I suppose, isn't it? Um, but they're doing pretty good on that, aren't they? The electrical, 311 jobs, only four out of SLS. It's pretty good. Four hours to respond or four hours to, to fix? Go? Yeah. Yeah, we don't have any resolve times. It's um, We should do. Because how do you fix a smashed window in four hours? You can respond to it and make it safe in four hours, of course. So... Seven minutes left, okay. Um, there are lots of other charts on here. If I could see them, I would tell you about them. Reactive versus planned, the number of man hours we're spending. Um, predicti predictive uh, condition, uh, active permits across the, the campus, so where the permits are, condition of campus we looked at. And then we've got a load of stuff on catering. Um, so where all the catering orders are going ac across campus, how much money we're making from catering orders across campus, how many people were in attendance at those meetings, how many people are we serving tea and coffee. Uh, we've got all those things uh, listed in there. Um, costs that have been processed and sent to our finance system. So lots of things going on. I want to just go back to um, our presentation and just look at this one. So this is our energy manager. What the hell does that mean, right? Absolutely no idea, so I wrote it down. Um, he's put this is a, a forecast of Wi-Fi client, clients in one of our buildings uh, for January 18. So there's three parts to the graph. There is blue, you can just about see it behind. Uh, and the blue is the data set as recorded by our IT team of the Wi-Fi. Uh, the orange line is part of the actual data set which they then use for training the forecast method. So the first two thirds of the, the month's data. And then the green line is then the forecast. So you can see we've forecasted and how close that is to the blue line which is the actual data that came along. So they're using Wi-Fi counts as a proxy for occupancy. Um, they're not interested in how many people are in there. Um, but they're comparing that and they're looking at the energy consumption, etc. cetera. Um, the forecast that they've used is a long short-term memory um, LSTM model, um, also used in Amazon Alexa iPhone and now LU energy efficiency. So we're starting to look at these things that all these big technology giants are using and predicting uh, where it's going to be. If you wanted me to ask any questions on that, no chance. Uh, I will refer you to our energy manager, who is quite brilliant. So they're using this model. Correct. Correct, yeah. Some really clever people. Again, he's using students for a lot of it, a lot of lecturers um, being used to, to get him the data that he needs, because we don't have the resource in-house, of course. We're not experts in this. This was the survey results, and we wanted to have a quick chat about this, really, because uh, I said this morning, you've got quantity to um, the results. We've got all that quantity of data. Now we'd like some quality behind it. Um, when we look at GIS, because you're all big users of GIS, um, I'm just wondering if you can tell me why GIS is number one in the US? What is it giving you guys? It's shaking your head. You have no idea. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, am I using GIS then in Tableau? Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty, it's good for us. Um, anyone else? Why, why GIS number one? Give me some quality to this uh, this data. Thick, you were giving me some thick data. Do you want to just use it? Sorry, I meant to be doing this out. 
I think with the popularity of the CAD um, technologies in the 80s and 90s and how GIS kind of complemented that really well. And so by now it's been entrenched and uh, into the culture of many institutions. So I think that's why it's kind of stayed at the top. That's my personal observation, not based on any data. So I thought it might be because you all get given ArcGIS for free. <laughs> um, turns out that we do in the UK as well, and none of us knew about it. I only found this out last week that um, we, we, we've got it as well. None of us knew, none of us <laughs> are using it. Nick, where's, where's the red and blue on this graph? Sorry, yeah, I should have um, pointed that out this morning. So. The blue, um, so these were rated one to however many there are there. So did they like check off the technology they use or something? Correct. So they were, were basically saying everything that you use, give a tick to, and is it at, uh, where, you, where is it in your priorities? So um, priority level, everyone was ticking number one for GIS, perhaps. Um, but what we've done, the blue line represents where everyone has uh, ticked one to three, something like that. So it's on the top of our mind. And then four to six is the orange, and then the gray is after that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So uh, in this handout, do you see a TA node? Correct. Okay. Yeah. That probably is the GIS one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say um, it went out to the US, it went out to the CFT membership which is 64 universities, and we are heavily focused on GIS. There's 4,000 universities in the U.S., so again, that gets back to thick data versus, what was the other one? The op big. big, big data. So I don't know what big data would yield, but uh, it may not be quite as revealing as this. But for our user base, GIS is pretty significant. And uh, you know, the driver for that is that you get the visualization of the data and integration of data, and that's why I think it's such a big component for us, is to visualize the data. Yeah, I think based on what Monty was saying, is uh, the word that uh, I always think is integration. The uh, uh, GIS is, a, ArcGIS is an integration platform, so we can use it to integrate with the other uh, systems. And, and uh, visualization and integration, the integration being a part of it, that's what differentiates it from uh, Tableau in a sense that the data can go back and forth. Okay. Um, just thinking about that though, because all I'm doing with Tableau is taking a live de uh, de feed from Planon and sticking it into Planon. You can do that in GIS, right? You can link to a SQL server in GIS. I'm just gonna do that when I get home uh, because <laughs> I've got free art GIS on my machine. So I'm just gonna play with this now and see where I get with it. So next year I might come back and I'm gonna kick all your asses with this. <laughs> <laughs> no chance that that's happening by the way. <laughs> uh, is there anything else anybody else would like to, to add? Then we're out of time and I, I thank you for attendance. <laughs>